namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya So this is uh, Canto 11, Chapter 7, Verse Number 1, Lord Krishna Instructs Uddhava. Here comes the board. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Yaryata Mam Mahabhaga Tajjikir Sitam Eva Me Brahma Bhava Loka Pala Swarvasam May Bikangsinaha Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Yaratamam Mahabhaga Tajjikir Sitam Eva Me Brahma Bhava Loka Pala Swarvasam Me Bikangsinaha Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Yaratam Ham Mahabhaga Tajtikir Sitam Eva Me Brahma Bhavo Loka Pala Swavasam Me Bikangsinaha Ladies, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, the Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Yat, that which, Atta, 
you spoke mum to me Mahabhaga O greatly fortunate Uddhava Tat that Chikir Sitam the program that I the program that I am desiring to execute Eva certainly may mine Brahma Lord Brahma Baba Lord Shiva Lokapala the leaders of all universal planets Swavasam abode in Vaikuntha may my Abhikanksinaha they are desiring translation the Supreme Personality of Godhead said O greatly fortunate Uddhava you have accur accurately revealed my desire to withdraw the idol dynasty from the earth and return to my own abode in Vaikuntha thus Lord Brahma Lord Shiva and other planetary rulers are now praying to me to resume my residence in Vaikuntha Lok Vaikuntha purport each and every demigod has a particular abode in the heavenly planets within the material universe although Lord Vishnu is sometimes counted amongst the demigods his abode is in Vaikuntha the spiritual sky the demigods are universal controllers within the kingdom of Maya but Vishnu is the Lord of the illusory potency and many other spiritual potencies his exalted residence does not lie within the kingdom of this insignificant maidservant Maya. Lord Vishnu, the personality of Godhead, is the supreme lord of all lords. The demigods are his parts and parcels, being themselves minute jiva souls. The demigods are under the influence of the potency of Maya, but Lord Vishnu is always the supreme controller of Maya. The personality of Godhead is the reservoir and root of all existence and the material world is just a dim reflection of the brilliant scenery of his eternal spiritual abode where everything is infinitely beautiful and pleasurable. Vishnu is the supreme reality and no living entity can ever be equal to or greater than him. The Lord exists within his own unique category called Vishnu Tattva or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All other prominent or extraordinary living entities owe their positions and potencies to the Lord. Ultimately Vishnu himself is the plenary expansion of Lord Krishna, the original source of all Vishnu and Jiva Tattva expansions. Thus Lord Krishna is the basis of everything. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gyanarajana Svakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai hmm. So Krishna is speaking and he's uh, talking to Uddhava and he's actually congratulating Uddhava in the sense that Uddhava understood the mind of the Lord and his mission uh, and in such a way that the Lord had to do something which is very highly critical and it's very practically hardly anyone can understand it he had to arrange for his own family members to fight amongst each other <laughs> in order to fulfill his desire for them to return back to their positions 
in the heavenly realms and also in the Vaikuntha realms. Hmm. This Leela is a great mystery. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati comments on it in his uh, discussion uh, for about 20 pages. It's not easy to understand why the Lord arranged for his own family members to fight amongst each other. And the fighting was inspired by intoxication. <laughs> so here we see certain things that Vaishnavas are very much uh, encouraged to avoid, such things as intoxication, and fighting amongst each other. <laughs> but this was the plan of the Lord. Why? <laughs> The Lord could understand now that although he came and his mission was successful in that yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavadi bharatam abhutanam tadharmasya sridatmaham sridramiyaham pranitranayam sadunam vinasanaya chaduskritam dharma samstarpana payam sambhavami yuge yuge. So the Lord comes when irreligion becomes prominent. When it becomes so prominent that those who are empowered by him on the earth cannot counteract. So he has to come personally. In other words, this is an emergency. <laughs> so he comes to the material world and he helps to bring back religious principles. Otherwise, the world would go to hell. It's already in hell now. But, and the Lord is here. He's here in his form as many forms actually in Srimad Bhagavatam is the incarnation of the Lord and he's also personally present in his transcendental form as the deity but he's very actively present in purifying the world through the holy name so the Lord has actually manifested himself in three forms at least and he's also here in his pure devotees so especially in Kali Yuga he creates his uh, energies from various sources of himself to empower them to do the work of uplifting the conditioned souls. But it's all his desire. So now the burden of the earth has somewhat relief. The demons have been killed, all the prominent demons, Kamsa, Jarasandha, Shishupal, Shava, others who are calling, causing such havoc on earth. But now another problem arose powerful family. How many members Krishna had in his family? My God. Krishna had 16,108 wives or queens and each one had 10 sons. And each son had 10 more sons. And it says that they, each one had one daughter too. <laughs> Just to balance it out a little bit. And uh, so you can imagine. So there were actually millions of family members of the Lord on the earth at that time. And we also know, and we hear about it from Shastras, that if one is connected to the Lord in, a, in some lineage, there's a tendency to be proud. Mm -hmm. Just like we have now we hear people in areas of Navadweep, that they are descendants of Lord Nityananda, mm -hmm. descendants of, you know, Lord Chaitanya, and some of... So there is sometimes that is misused and becomes a source of pride and a source of exploitation of others. Being, having an exceptional birth within a family that is directly connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this is what was happening. So this powerful Yadu dynasty, so powerful that now, although the Krishna's desire had been fulfilled, now what was created was another problem. So the Lord used his mystical potency to create a situation which was quite unusual. Well, some of the members of the Yadu dynasty, children, headed by one of Krishna's grandsons, Samba. And they uh, decided to make some joke. And they wanted to play the joke on the sadhus. 
So they dressed up Sada, uh, Samba as a lady. And they put this iron ball in her abdomen as if she was pregnant. And then they came before the sadhus. You can see, it's actually a, a painting the devotees had drawn. Narada Muni's there, and many other great personalities. And they said, my dear great sages, all, 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 all knowing ones, this personality here is pregnant. What will be the child? <laughs> Now, the sages could understand that they, the, the children were mimicking them. And that was an offense to come before four great sages and play this kind of frivolous joke. But the sages turned around and made something, and they said, well, actually, the, the birth of this child will be the destruction of your whole dynasty. <laughs> Haribo. <laughs> they didn't expect to hear that. So what happens, they, takes this, they took this iron ball, in which the sages had cursed, and they cut it into so many pieces and grind it up in iron filings and threw it in the river. And then the water at one point washed these iron filings on the shore, and then these iron filings started to grow into bamboo sticks. <laughs> But one piece was not, was not completely was ground up, and that piece was swallowed by a fish. Now, this is interesting. You see how Krishna arranges everything. Now, the Yadus are together, and they have, they're a little bit intoxicated. So they're drinking this beverage called it's a rice type of intoxication, a rice liquor. So they get intoxicated and then they start arguing amongst each other. So the argument becomes so intense that they become really angry and start fighting. So these bamboo sticks are available, so they pick them up, which are actually iron rods, and they start fighting amongst each other. And gradually they were killing. It says that the bigger yadu was destroying the smaller yadu. So all of, practically all of Krishna's family members were destroyed in this fight. And Krishna's desire was fulfilled. That one piece, which was swallowed by a fish, was ca caught by a, this hunter, Jara. He caught this fish, and when he cut open the fish, he saw this metal piece. And so, being a hunter also, he made a little arrowhead out of it and fixed it on his arrow. And then one day, he saw his personality sitting beneath a tree, and, <laughs> and he fired that arrow. And he fired it at Krishna. It was actually Krishna sitting very calmly in a very, calm, what we say, uh, relaxed position. And he hits Krishna in the foot, and Krishna dies. Haribo. <laughs> So this is a whole show by the Supreme Personality of God to go back to God, to, for him to re-enter his spiritual abode and for the Yadus to come back. Now, of course, nobody dies by getting shot in the foot with an arrow. <laughs> but Krishna did. Why did Krishna do that? Uh, why didn't he just, you know, go back to the spiritual world in, this, in a normal way or in a different way? Something was less violent? Because there was, as Prabhupada says, that hardly anyone who saw Krishna actually understood he was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Many thought that he was simply a very powerful personality or even the demigod himself. And there were the others who had no faith in Krishna at all. So Krishna didn't want to destroy that false understanding of himself. And therefore, he left the world just to keep the illusion. <laughs> Why? Because one can only approach Krishna through bhakti. Bhakti amama vijananti. Unless one 
worships Krishna in devotion, one cannot understand Krishna. <laughs> one can philosophize, read so many books, and try to understand the Supreme Lord from various angles of vision, through various types of, what we say, mental adjustments, philosophical discussions, various types of pujas. But unless one actually worships Krishna in devotion, Krishna says, one can never understand me. And even those who worship in devotion, hardly, Krishna says, you know, hardly one knows me in truth. So in order to keep his position within the process of devotional service, he, just, he, he left the world. And people say, oh, Krishna was killed by a hunter. And the Yadu dynasties were just, just intoxicated. And so that illusion goes on, or that discussion goes on. But devotees understand that this, is this, this little show is not also the way the Lord wants to do things because even this material world, as is mentioned here, and Prabhupada gives his, no, I'm sorry, the, the devotees of Srila Prabhupada have given a very interesting point that although the Lord comes within the material energy, he's not part of the material energy. But the material energy works under the direction of the Lord to fulfill the desires of the Lord and to fulfill the desires of the living entities who want to become separate from the Lord. <laughs> this material world is like a, a drama <laughs> where the living entities play a part that is not them. <laughs> they act out the part in different manifestations of physical categories such as male, female, and in different positions within the society becoming you know, presidents or ministers or ordinary people play different roles. And sometimes, and of course, that's the nature of the illusionary energy that one identifies with this role as oneself. And so this whole material world is like a big show. It's like a drama. N none of the actors are actually who they actually are. <laughs> They're in the wrong consciousness. But because they've been rehearsed by who? Maya. <laughs> Maya is the drama conductor. <laughs> and Maya is just simply, simply fulfilling their desires to stay separate from the Lord. And they're cast into different roles according to that desire. And this is all the illusionary energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Krishna comes and he appears to be just like that. In other words, he's also playing a particular role. You see, when he came within the, wor the world, he became the chariot driver of his devotee Arjuna. And although he was the supreme personality of Godhead, he didn't fight on the battle of Kurukshetra, although it was his desire that the Pandavas become victorious. So Krishna played, and apparently, a, just a role as, a, as another Kshatriya within this great drama of bringing back Krishna consciousness with, at a time when the world had become overburdened with so many, what we say, unsaintly and nefarious kings. So here, it's mentioned that Krishna is being called back by Brahma and Shiva. So everything is being conducted by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Prabhupada writes in one purport in the eighth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's something very instructive. And what is that instructive point? It's based on a particular pastime. The pastime is the demons and the demigods are fighting against each other. Sometimes people mistakenly think, oh, if I can go to the heavenly planets, life will be very nice. And people perform devotional service in order to get in better material situations. Prabhupada said something very shocking to us. 
He said, many of my disciples will attain swarga, loka. When I heard that, I, I was thinking, oh my God, that's horrible. <laughs> to perform devotional service and not become, what we say, uh, elevated to the spiritual consciousness, but elevated to performing devotional service in order to get a better material situation. And that's, that can be done without performing devotional service, simply by pious activities. So in the heavenly planets, it's not a nice place. Why? Because the illusion of happiness is greater. There's various kinds of illusions. One can be, in a, when one is suffering, one can understand that this, this is not a nice place, but when one is materially getting some benefit from one's activities, one might think, it's not so bad here. Or even if it is, I can make it better, because I'm intelligent, I have facilities, I have good credits, bias activities. So coming to the heavenly planets is another form of suffering. And the suffering is all, the illusion of the happiness is the greatest form of suffering, but even that, it's plain that in the heavenly planets, there's always fights between the demigods and the demons. And sometimes the demigods are kicked out of their abode. And then they have to go to, to Brahma, and Brahma has to talk to Vishnu, and Vishnu has to come up with a plan. Just like when, when um, Indra committed an offense against his spiritual master, Brihaspati. The demigods lost all their shakti, and the demons just practically walked into the heavenly planets and took over. The demigods could even fight because of the offense to their spiritual master. And so they came to Brahma, and Brahma went to Vishnu. Vishnu made a plan. Vishnu told them how they can get their power back. And so, headed by Indra, they went. And when they approached uh, Vishwarup, asked him to give him to perform sacrifices on behalf of them in order to get the power. But when they found out Vishwarup was actually also performing sacrifices on behalf of the demons, they killed Vishwarup, who was a Brahmana. <laughs> and Vishwarup's uh, father, was it, Twasta? Yeah. He, he got angry at the demigods, and so he performed the puja to kill Indra, and then that's where Vichrasura comes in. And then there's another fight. So it's not so nice in the heavenly planet, there's always these battles going on. But in, this, in reference to this one pastime, where they're fighting, and the demons are being killed, but Maya Donovan has created this elixir of nectar that every time the demon is killed he's thrown into this elixir and he comes back in his back to life and even stronger so now another problem <laughs> what to do so the demons although being killed are coming back even stronger after being killed by this elixir and so now what to do so they go to brahma and brahma gets him some advice for sh from Vishnu, Vishnu tells them, Brahma, you become a cow, and Shiva, you become a calf, and you drink up all the elixir. So they do. So now, the demons don't know what to do. Their rejuvenation energy is being destroyed. So Maya Dhanava is bewildered. He doesn't know what to do. And then he comes to the realization that this is actually the plan of the Lord. So then after realizing it was the plan of the Lord, he realizes there's nothing higher than that, so what can I do? So Prabhupada writes in this particular purport that you have your plan and I have my plan. <laughs> Prabhupada puts himself in the position of a conditioned soul. You have your plan and I have my plan. But what is Krishna's plan? <laughs> he said, that is the real plan. So knowing the plan of the Lord, or trying to know the plan of the Lord in relationship to our activities becomes the feature of success in devotional service. So how do you know the plan of the Lord? 
Some of us might try to figure it out ourselves. But the plan of the Lord is known by the confidential servants of the Lord who teach that message as the means for understanding Krishna's plan. But Krishna has many plans. And his real plan, or his, well, not real plan, but his big plan is again to purify the world and make it Krishna consciousness. So the ultimate principle of the plan of the Lord within the context of devotional activities is to assist Krishna in bringing the conditioned souls back to him. That is the ultimate intimate plan of the Lord and anyone who takes up this mood of extending their bhakti to the point of wanting to help others become Krishna. In other words, reaching out to others in the form of Krishna consciousness is actually within the, in, the secret plan of the Lord. And how, to, how that will be revealed is according to how Krishna wants that to happen as Krishna consciousness expands throughout the world. So this is the understanding. Devotees want to assist the Lord and assist the Lord's pure devotees in bringing the conditioned souls back. Because material world is such a horrible place. People are suffering tremendously. Even if they have so many material facilities. And material facilities are easy to come by. But as Radhanath Maharaj mentioned last night in his opening talk, the opening part of his talk last night, things and anything in this material world cannot touch the heart and gives happiness, satisfaction, and peace of mind. It only comes with love, and love is the, the basis of love is the relationship with Krishna. And that when that a relationship with Krishna is established, then that love goes to all others, to all other living entities, because Krishna is the mula. He is the root of everything that exists. So devotees and those who have the intelligence who understand that the, the real activity of devotional service is to be an instrument for the Lord's mercy to others, whatever way we can. Um, Krishna has given everyone some abilities. Krishna has given everyone some intelligence Krishna, has, Krishna says, I am the ability and in all living entities. So whatever that is, according to the guidance of the higher authorities, the spiritual masters, the great devotees, that can be used as a great purifying, it purifies the heart of those who use it and it ultimately extends out as a form of compassion to those who are suffering in this material world. <laughs> Because material world means suffering. Prabhupada said, if anybody says that they're happy here, you kick him. <laughs> he said, kick him right on the nose. <laughs> I guess that will be a reminder it's not a nice place. <laughs> but this idea of have, becoming happy here, it was a discussion. Prabhupada's talking about material happiness. And basically he's saying there's no material habit. There's no material habit, nothing. So then we also hear that the Shastras give some understanding that there is something. There is some happiness in this world. And what is that in the mode of goodness? So the mode of goodness is, has a certain characteristic of being called, there's some happiness there. But then Prabhupada goes on to explain, quoting Vyapati, the great poet, Vaishnava poet, that material happiness is society, family, and love. The happiness of family life. So he mentions that that happiness is like a drop of water in the desert. And even today, to find that drop within the realm of material happiness is very difficult. Even the drop is hard to find. I think Maharaj was saying last night in his class that, or his talk is that, you know, there were two, husband and wife, they're arguing. And they can't somehow or other settle their differences. So it's becoming 
a feature of counseling now, and then they need advice from the outside. There's still some hope. So after various, what we say, boiling down what is not the cause, they came to the real cause. Do you remember what Maharaj said? It was like, you know, when you cut the bread, you give me the end piece. And that, and that means you don't love me. <laughs> and you take the middle. I mean, that's, that's really serious. <laughs> I was thinking, when Maharaj was saying, I was thinking of another story where this was in India. It was in a newspaper I was reading in here in India. Husband and wife are also fighting. And the husband is really angry at the, no, the wife is really angry at the husband. And she's ready to divorce him. And they're fighting all the time because he fails to put the toothpaste top back on the toothpaste. And when she comes into the bathroom and sees the toothpaste top off the toothpaste, you know, she reminds him, but he doesn't change. So this, this is the grounds for divorce. Very serious. <laughs> Very serious. You know, that toothpaste could dry up. That's a loss. <laughs> so this is, you know, when somehow or other we find that, you know, people get overly disturbed by little things. And these things cause big things to fall apart, such as a marriage or something. So we're talking about happiness in the material world. So therefore, what, the, what is that? And so Prabhupada's discussing this happiness, and the devotees are saying, yes, Prabhupada. Because when, when Prabhupada was here, I think Malati can probably confirm this. She was there with many of Prabhupada's discussions with his devotees and being a part of that. Prabhupada was challenged a lot. <laughs> Prabhupada also said that. He said, the Americans don't take anything easy. <laughs> You really have to convince them. <laughs> so Prabhupada went out his limits to really try to, to understand the men American mentality is that you, we have to convince you completely before you're going to actually believe what I say. <laughs> so, and so many times Prabhupada was challenged by his disciples. The challenging was done in a respectful way, always, was always respectful. But Prabhupada got that. So they said, well, Prabhupada, actually, you know, you write in your books that the, the mode of goodness is uh, concomitant con with happiness. So, yeah, it's there. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, but the main principle of the mode of goodness is knowledge. And that knowledge tells you there's no happiness. <laughs> So well, that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> so Prabhupada wanted to make the point that knowledge is actually the feature of reality and understanding what is, what is truth and what is not truth. So this material, so people are really absorbed in trying to find happiness where there's no happiness. Mm -hmm. And therefore the world's going to hell. <laughs> They're on the wrong course. Prabhupada talks about that if you're doing a, a mathematical qua equation and you're trying to come up with a particular result, but you make some uh, arithmetic mistake somewhere in the middle of the equation, then everything you do after that is wrong, even if you do everything else right. Why? Because the basis is all wrong. The fundamental principle is off no matter how much you might calculate mathematics correctly after that because you made a mistake somewhere in the beginning and therefore everything is off. So Prabhupada said this is material society. The basis is completely off. What is the, what is the, the basis? The basis is I am this body and the mind and senses and the intelligence are the sources of fine happiness through the material energy. So that whole principle is wrong <laughs> because we're not this body. And as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, 
Yehi samsparsa de aboga, dukkha yoni evate, avanta vanta kunti, anateshu ramate buddha. And material life means to suffer. Sense gratification is the source of suffering. So what goes on as happiness is actually the, the basis for suffering. So the whole principle is wrong. But still, we have our senses, people have their senses, mind and intelligence, and that's how they interact with the, the external energy. So bringing Krishna consciousness as a feature of activity, or service to Krishna as a feature of activity, engages the senses nicely and properly and elevates the consciousness where one can understand what is real satisfaction and what is the real goal of life. So devotees have that knowledge. So it's our, what we say, responsibility to take that knowledge and bring it to the conditioned souls. And that way, if one person, Prabhupada said, if you make one person fully Krishna conscious and that person goes back home, back to Godhead, you automatically go. In other words, that's how dear a preacher becomes, that if one person becomes Krishna conscious. Just say, say you are a parent in a family and you raise your child and that child becomes fully Krishna conscious. But you don't become fully Krishna conscious. But somehow because of your proper direction and guidance and care for that child, it becomes fully Krishna conscious. That doesn't mean you, you don't try. <laughs> oh, I'll just make my son Krishna conscious and my daughter and then he'll make it and I'll get a free ticket. <laughs> no, that's, it's not like that. But what is, what, is the, what is the Shastric principle is that when you become an instrument for the success of others, that benefit also extends to you. We also hear that, that if a devotee becomes fully Krishna conscious and becomes liberated, then 14 generations of one's family members also get that benefit. In other words, they, they take birth in devotee families and also can come in that family, they can, come, they can become fully Krishna conscious. So that is the mercy of the Lord that extends to those who take Krishna's mercy in whatever direction, it, if it comes and makes one person Krishna conscious. Of course, we don't want one person, we want the whole world. We want to make, we, we want to fulfill the desire of the great souls. Prabhupada says the desires of the great souls is when everyone in the world becomes fully spirit, Krishna conscious. They're not fully satisfied until all living entities. Why? Because they love Krishna so much knowing that is Krishna's desire. And everyone becomes his devotee. Everyone is his devotee, but everyone is misguided. So that is the purpose of this Krishna conscious movement is to bring Krishna consciousness to everyone. Okay, any questions or comments? Yes, Radhika, is it? Okay. Uh, you, okay, do we have a microphone? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the enlightening class. Uh, Brigumuni once he kicked uh, Lord Vishnu on the chest and he hurt Brigu our... Brigumuni, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he hurt our Krishna. And second time he shot an arrow at his lotus feet. And he, whatever, but we understand that this is the will of the Lord and this is how he wants to uh, wind up his pastimes. Uh, in the earlier uh, chapter, it's mentioned the place from where Brigumuni shot the arrow at Lord Sri Krishna's lotus feet. That place is called Brigutirtha. Yeah. So um, my question to you is that why is it called a Tirtha when he's hurt our Krishna? Though it's Krishna's <laughs> will. Why is it called a Tirtha? Because, because he shot Krishna? Yes. Then why is it called a Tirtha? Why the Acharya is right? 
Krishna was there, personally. Anywhere Krishna performs his pastimes is a tirtha. For Krishna, good and bad don't exist. That's a material concept. For Krishna, everything is of, of the na nature of the absolute. Not, no one can do anything bad to Krishna. Krishna is completely transcendental. He is not part of this material energy. In fact, he conducts the material energy through him. Parashya Shakti Vedahaya Suyate Svabhavigyana Palakriya Cha. All the material energy works according to his desire. He is the power, he is the intelligence, and he is the facility. All three, that's mentioned in that verse, that makes the material energy work in a certain way, according to his will. So you might look at it from a position of bad, or we might see it in a position of bad and good, but that's, that's from a relative material consciousness. For those who understand the nature of the Lord, this is a place where the Lord performed his pastimes of disappearance. So therefore, it's an activity of transcendence by the Lord. It's a significant one because the Lord wound up his pastimes in a particular way. So Tirtha means holy place or place where the Lord performs his leelas. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Uh, you quoted that Prabhupada said somewhere in the purport that many of my disciples will uh, go to Swargaloka. That was a statement by Prabhupada. That, that That's not, not written, but he said it twice that, that I have heard. Mm -hmm. So I think I missed the conclusion of you quoting that. Was the that conclusion was that if we don't perform devotional service, if we mix in material desires in our devotional service, then we don't qualify ourselves to attain the pure, the, the results of devotional service. The results of devotional service, or the goal of devotional service, is Prema Pumarta Mahan, developing love for Krishna. So if one consciously wants material happiness along with the, the execution of devotional service, that's karma mishra bhakti. Although there's some bhakti there, there is bhakti there, obviously. Bhakti is everywhere in different elements of itself. But in this element, then one will elevate oneself to a better material position. But then we understand from the shastras that anything in material, abrahma bhuvana loka purna vritti arjuna, any, anything in this material world is temporary. So therefore one will again fall down to the middle planetary systems and again have to perform devotional service again to elevate themselves back to the spiritual position. Their pious activities are like money, it runs out. So, Prabodhananda Saraswati gives a very nice verse where he explains that material happiness is akash pushpayate. Akash means sky, and push, push means push, pushpa in this case means flowers. Um, the flowers that grow in the sky. So, how many flowers do you see growing in the sky? If you do see that, that means you're ha you have another problem. <laughs> we won't mention that. <laughs> or if you happen to come across some eggs of a horse. <laughs> so these things are called phantasmagoria. They don't exist. But they're described. So they're described, why? Because for the materialists, not for the devotees. So, therefore, one has to be aware 
of the how to execute devotional service in such a way that that one doesn't look or keep, maintain certain desires for material happiness. How do you do that? By always taking association of advanced devotees and understanding the process. If you do that, then things will become clear. It is said, Prabhupada mentions also in one statement that those in the higher planets who have some intelligence and understand the mercy of the Lord in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's descent, in this yuga, want to come into this Iskan society in order to practice devotional service and therefore there's a direct way to go back home, back to Godhead. So Prabhupada said many of the children that are born in this movement have come from, from different places in order to be part of Lord Chaitanya's movement. <laughs> but that's not the goal. The goal is Prema Pumartam Maha. Nowhere is there, there are intermediate goals in bhakti. What are those intermediate goals? Is that you may try to achieve something to establish a certain service and devotional service, but that, that is meant to lead to, a, to ultimately to prema. Our goal is pure love of God, because unless the living entity comes to that stage, then one has to again take birth. And Prabhupada makes a nice, very strong statement. He says, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that if you practice devotional service and you still don't elevate yourself to per perfection, then uh, what is that verse? Suchinan Simatam Gehe Yoga Brasta Padaya Jay. That one can come back in a very nice family, a uh, pious family, religious family, and again have the opportunity for devotional service. But that's concessionary. Concessions are not the goal. And then Prabhupada expands on that idea that what stopped you, he's speaking in general, what stopped you from becoming a pure devotee, you still have to face it in the next life. <laughs> that same anartha or material desire will again be something you have to overcome. So he says, why wait till next life? Finish in this, in this life. <laughs> In other words, aspire for pure devotional service. Even if you don't make it, still you should aspire for it. <laughs> because that is the nature of the soul. <laughs> and aspiring for it means that you open up the opportunities for the success. If you aspire for something less than pure devotional service, then the opportunities for pure devotional service don't become so easily available because you're aspiring in a certain way. Therefore, your, your desire leads you in a certain direction. When you aspire for pure devotional service, then you get all the facilities to make that desire uh, successful. Then it's up to you to take advantage of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Malati, would you like to say something in regards to Maybe some experience you had with Prabhupada. Pass the microphone to Malati Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Actually, I'm going back to the bickering means arguing couple. Oh, okay. Most disagreements, most arguments are generally a result of lack of or miscommunication. Lack of communication, effective communication. Yeah. <clears throat> so in the case of this couple that was arguing on the verge of divorce, the argument was started because the husband felt the wife did not love him. And 
That wasn't really expressed, however, but because that was in the heart, his whatever the wife would do, if it didn't come up to his mark, it was in his mind a sign that she did not love him. So when they finally got to the point of the big D divorce and went to the counselor, there was an interesting outcome. It's, the wife was from Italy. Mm. So as things started to get unpeeled, like you have an onion and it has so many layers, and you start peeling the layers, you know. So they were peeling the layers of this onion of miscommunication or lack of communication. And finally, it was understood the problem was he felt she didn't love him. And the proof was she always gave him the end piece of the bread. The wife was shocked out of her mind. She was Italian, and she explained in her country Italy, the most prized part of the bread is the end piece because it's nice and crispy and crunchy and has so much texture and flavor. So when you really care about somebody, you offer the person the end piece of the bread. And that's what she was doing. But somehow in his culture, that was like, you throw it to the dogs. Yeah. So he was feeling dishonored by her act of love because he did not understand where she was coming from and nor did he explain to her why he was having this you know, difficulty. It wasn't about the bread, it was what it symbolized in his mind. And the whole thing could have been resolved instantly had there been a communication. communication. So just like <clears throat> Arjuna finally opened up his heart to Krishna and Krishna responded and there was an amicable agreement. So in the same way as we deal with each other in life, particularly with devotees, we need to learn how to effectively communicate so that we can effectively assist each other in our Krishna consciousness. Mm. Yes, communication is the first step. <laughs> Just like in the process of bhakti, that takes the form of hearing. So the initial principle of the execution of bhakti is to hear. And then, in order to clarify some of the points of hearing that may be unclear, one should ask questions. Sometimes we hear, and we may also assume something is in a certain way, but with further questionings, and when we say opening the doors of communication, we find it may be even different. So yeah, that's the basis of, of life, is to hear and then to clarify if there's some need for clarification. But nowadays we find, you know, people assume they know even though one is hearing and there's some, there's some apparent communication going on, to actually understand the intention means sometimes is, is not delved in far enough. As you said, the, he was watching her and he was experiencing exactly what she was doing, but he made an assumption. He could have said, why are you always giving me that? <laughs> or, there must be some reason you're giving me that. I think marriage means communication, right? <laughs> the whole world is based on communication. But there's such an overload of communication that now things are going on in such a way that people are putting out forms of communication, but it doesn't really communicate. Either because of the way it's being done, or 
because there's such an overload that people just assume I know. Therefore, when you hear something, two things should happen. This is in Vaishnava circles. One, you should get some realization based on what you hear. Or two, you should ask questions based on what you hear. If you don't get either one, then that means you're not communicating. Realization means understanding. But assumption is not a very nice word. Sometimes we make fun of that word. A S S U M E A S S assumption as you and me. Assuming makes an ass out of you and me. A S S U M U me ass. <laughs> so it's not a nice word. So to assume is convenient, but it's not communication. <laughs> yeah. Prabhupada, when Prabhupada would talk to his disciples, he would inspire them by trying to bring out points more and more, and then they would get into some nice discussions. And then by that discussion, you go deeper into the understanding of what is being discussed. Okay. So specifically in relationships, it's important that everything becomes clear. But one has to be sensitive on how to bring out that point. If one demands and assumes that one should be you know, accountable for everything they do without proper questioning and answering. In other words, okay, um, I'm going to question everything you do so I can understand. But it has to be done in a, in a way that is done respectfully and for the person's position and relationship and not being done as a, uh, a forced responsibility. Like, explain yourself. <laughs> so communication is a very sensitive thing, it's a very dynamic thing, it's easily misunderstood. There's so many things that go wrong with communication, there's so many things that go wrong with not communicating. <laughs> so, but the most important thing is to become very clear and very sensitive in the process of communication. Mm -hmm. And that requires respect, respect for the person. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, somehow I live in this world. Why or how? He goes, how? How do I live in this world? Because I give respects to everyone. <laughs> so, so devotee keeps that mood of respecting every living entity as part and parcel of Krishna and the etiquette that comes with proper respect based on that relationship. So that's something that keeps, needs to be done constantly in our relationships. So, because misunderstanding can cause catastrophes. <laughs> Just like we have some of our big leaders in the world throwing uh, sutras at each other, <laughs> right? If you do this, I'll do this. And if you do this, I'll do this. And if you don't do this, I'll do this. And so, a lot of times they don't even understand each other, but they just want to just go back and forth. And then wars are created because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can stop here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam, Ki Jai.